4.58 a.m. Saturday the 1st of June. Okay, Saturday the 1st of June, 4.58 a.m. Became one soul. Became one soul. What does that mean? No questions now. Please, to assure Smith, search no more. Blessings are near. Do not kill my daughter, please. I mean, please. We love and miss y'all. Get good Let rest me... tonight. Goodbye. <laughs> Wait a minute. He's gone, Mom. It was the last day of May in 1985, and Sherry Smith had just completed her final year at Lexington High School in South Carolina. The 17-year-old couldn't wait to set off on a cruise with her friends in just two days to celebrate the start of a new chapter. But unfortunately, a brush with evil was about to change everything. The bright and outgoing young student was happy to be spending the day at an end-of-year pool party, she arrived home just before four that evening, which her father knew because he saw her car turn into their long driveway. Expecting to hear his daughter walk through the front door moments later, he carried on with what he was doing, but after five or ten minutes of silence, he peeked back out the window. At the end of the driveway, he could see Sherry's car parked by the mailbox, and that's when he got the feeling that something just wasn't right. So the concerned father raced down the driveway hoping to find his daughter sitting behind the wheel with an easy explanation for the delay. However, as he approached the car, his fears only escalated. Sherry was nowhere in sight, and her car was left running with the driver's side door wide open and her purse still inside on the passenger's seat. Even more alarming, he could see footprints leading from the open door to the mailbox, but none returning, and their mail was scattered all over the ground. The scene was disturbing to say the least, but the nightmare for Sherry's family was only just beginning. Investigators from the Lexington County Sheriff's Department were alerted to Sherry's suspicious disappearance right away, as it was clear that she wouldn't have just left on her own, not only because she was trustworthy and excited for the next chapter in her life, but also because she had diabetes and would never leave without her medication. Detectives took one look at the scene and determined the most likely scenario was that Sherry had exited her car to collect the mail and was ambushed by someone, dropping the mail during the struggle. A massive search began immediately for whoever had taken Sherry. It was actually the most extensive search effort in South Carolina's history at the time, but despite this, they found nothing. Sherry's family was absolutely beside themselves and made several public pleas for her safe return. Then, two days after Sherry vanished, something totally unexpected happened. The Smith family received a terrifying phone call from an unknown man who seemed to be using a device to distort his voice. He specifically requested to speak with Sherry's mother and claimed to have her daughter in his possession. The caller even described what the teenager had been wearing at the time of her disappearance. The strange man told the distraught mother that Sherry was doing just fine and watching television. And while he didn't demand any ransom, he wanted them to know that they would be receiving an important letter in the mail the next day. Detectives were able to trace the call to a payphone 20 miles from Sherry's home, but the mysterious caller was long gone by the time they got there. The following morning, investigators went to the Lexington Post Office to sort through the mail, and just like the man had said, they found a letter addressed to the Smith family. Still, nobody was prepared for the horror waiting inside that envelope. The first thing they saw was written in large print across the top of the letter, Last Will and Testament. What followed was a heartbreaking two-page letter, later confirmed to be written by Sherry in which she expressed love for her family and friends, saying, I know y'all love me and will miss me very much, but if you stick together like we always did, y'all can do it. She held on to her religious convictions and encouraged her family not to let her death ruin their lives, writing, Please do not become hard or upset. Everything works out for the good for those that love the Lord. But the scariest part of the letter was when she requested to have a closed casket at her funeral, knowing her body would be in no condition to be seen. Sherry's father was the first in the family to read the letter, but even after he shared it with the others, the Smith family refused to give up hope. Meanwhile, authorities sent the letter off for forensic testing to see if whoever took Sherry might have left behind some clues, but little did they know he was about to give them one. The Smith family received yet another phone call from the supposed abductor that very same day. You received the mail today? Uh, yes, I have. Do you believe me now? Well, I'm not really sure I believe you because I haven't had any word from Sherry. And I need to know that Sherry is well. You'll know. 
snow in two or three days. Why two or three days? Call the search off. The caller's voice and his choice of words makes it appear that this was truly a game for him, like a child playing a prank call. Later that evening, he called again, and this time, he said some particularly alarming things. I want to tell you one other thing. Sherry is now part of me, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. The fact that the caller says that Sherry is a part of him now, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, is bizarre and disturbing to say the least. People with psychopathy are grandiose, sometimes to the point of delusion, and they often fantasize about being these higher beings. We don't know the caller's actual diagnosis, but his statement on this part of the phone call shows indications of bizarre delusional grandiosity. This is highly dangerous when coupled with the other characteristics of the psychopath. No empathy, no remorse, and a lack of moral conscience. Whoever had Sherry seemed to enjoy the thrill of tormenting the Smith family and the power it offered him, as he called them again the next day. However, this time he spoke to Sherry's sister, Dawn, and it seemed to investigators that he may have slipped up when telling her what time Sherry had written the letter. 4.58 a.m. No, I'm sorry, hold on. 3.10 a.m. Saturday, the 1st of June, she hand wrote what you received. 4.58 a.m. Saturday, the 1st of June. Okay, Saturday, the 1st of June, 4.58 a.m. Became one soul. Became one soul. What does that mean? No questions now. Please, to a sure mess, search no more. Blessings are near. Do not kill my daughter, please. I mean, please. We love and miss y'all. Get good Let rest tonight. Goodbye. Wait a minute. He's gone, the words became one soul is a similar statement to what he had said previously about Sherry being part of him. Though we don't know their diagnosis, they may have had some other mental health issues in addition to severe psychopathy, possibly psychosis. People with psychosis will make statements like those in this clip that are bizarre, out of context, and don't make sense. Oh, but this deranged lunatic didn't stop there. He called the Smith home again the following afternoon and this time he cut right to the chase and gave Sherry's mother specific directions to a Masonic Lodge 18 miles away. Hello? Listen carefully. Take Highway 378 West to Traffic Circle. Take Prosperity Exit. Go one and a half miles. Turn right at sign. Moose Lodge number 103. Go one quarter mile. Turn left at White Frame Building. Go to Backyard, six feet beyond we're waiting. God chose us. The statement, God chose us, appears to be an indication of the presence of delusional thinking. It's the random, out-of-nowhere nature of these references to God and spirituality that demonstrate that there's likely some serious mental illness present. Authorities follow the directions until they reached a wooded area behind the lodge, and that's where they found Sherry's body, exactly where the caller had said it would be. Sherry's autopsy revealed that she had been deceased for around four days, with the medical examiner estimating that she was likely killed just 12 hours after the abduction. They also noted duct tape residue around her mouth, suggesting she may have died from suffocation. However, because Sherry's body had been exposed to the elements for an extended period, they couldn't determine her exact cause of death or gather any forensic evidence. Investigators now believe that when the killer said the wrong time during his phone call with Don, he accidentally told her the exact time her sister was murdered. At this point, Lexington police called in the FBI to create a detailed profile of the suspected perpetrator, and they categorized him as an organized killer who has likely committed other crimes. They theorized that he would be between his late 20s and early 30s, white, single, unattractive, overweight, and intelligent. They also believed he would have some knowledge of electronics and technology based on his ability to manipulate his voice for the phone calls. However, FBI agents and detectives agreed that he appeared to have been reading from a pre-written script during every call. The biggest giveaway was that he would sometimes trip over his words and then go back to the start of the sentence and repeat everything verbatim. But perhaps the most frightening aspect of the FBI's character profile was the indication that this man would likely kill again if not captured. And unfortunately, they were right. Despite Sherry's body being found, the killer continued to taunt the Smith family, primarily Dawn, 
with upsetting phone calls. While he would sometimes beg for forgiveness and say he was preparing to turn himself into the police, other conversations involved him threatening to take his own life and describing Sherry's death in graphic detail. During a particularly cruel call, he claimed to have asked Sherry how she wanted to die and said that she chose to be suffocated. Before hanging up, he said, God was ready to accept her as an angel, and then the call stopped for a while. After eight days of silence, detectives decided it would be a good idea to set up a trap for their killer. They knew he craved the attention, so the plan was to hold a highly publicized memorial service for Sherry in the hope that he would attend. They gave Don a stuffed koala, Sherry's favorite animal, to lay beside her grave, thinking the killer might return later to claim it as a souvenir, but he never came. Instead, he soon placed yet another call to the Smith family home, and I think it's important to note that at this point, he stopped using the device to distort his voice, suggesting he felt invincible to police. He started the call by telling Don, God wants you to join Sherry Fay, and that she could not be protected forever. But this time, he wanted to talk about someone else. Although it's believed that all psychopaths are sadistic, it seems that the killer in this case is especially sadistic because of the way he's enjoying the phone calls and tormenting Sherry's family. Have you heard about Deborah May Hamper? Uh, no. The 10 year old ATLMIC. Uh, Richland County? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, listen carefully. Two weeks after Sherry's disappearance and murder, a 10 year old girl named Deborah May Helmick was snatched from her front yard in broad daylight. Her father had been just a few steps away inside their home at the time, and exactly as he had done with Sherry, the killer gave detailed directions to Deborah May's body. Turn right, left dirt road before you come to stop sign at Two Notch Road. Go through chain and no trespassing sign. Go 50 yards and to the left. Go 10 yards. Deborah May is waiting. God forgive us all. What was particularly unusual is how he said, God forgive us all, when describing where the body of Deborah May was located. This comment is yet another indication that the caller could have had religious preoccupation and was likely delusional, which can occur among people with psychosis. It's important to keep in mind that having psychosis doesn't make someone a murderer. Deborah May showed the same signs of suffocation as Sherry, but due to the level of decomposition, her cause of death could not be definitively determined. Investigators also found no usable forensic evidence on her body. However, a clue from Sherry's last will and testament letter was about to blow the case wide open. A forensic document examiner used a device called an electrostatic detection apparatus to search for indentations left on the paper from other things the killer might have written down on different pages, and he struck gold. Amazingly, the device managed to pick up on what appeared to be a contact list of names and phone numbers. One of the numbers was nearly complete except for one missing digit, so detectives decided to begin there. They dialed the number, using all possibilities for the tenth digit, until finally someone answered on the other end. A young man picked up the phone, and when asked if he had any connection to South Carolina, he said that his parents, Ellis and Sharon Shepard, lived there. Oh, but not just anywhere in the state. They lived only 15 miles away from the Smith's home. Naturally, authorities raced over to speak with the Shepherds, but they explained that they had been on vacation when Sherry went missing. Still, detectives listed the characteristics of the supposed killer and played a recording of his undistorted voice for the couple. Then, without skipping a beat, Ellis and Sharon Shepherd exclaimed almost in unison, that's Larry Jean Bell. They explained that Larry had been house-sitting for them while they were on vacation and investigators quickly realized that some of the phone calls made to the Smith family after Sherry's disappearance came from the Shepherd's home. Furthermore, Ellis confirmed that he and his wife had left the list of numbers found by the forensic examiner for Larry in case of an emergency. So, who is Larry Jean Bell, you ask? Well, we don't know much about his childhood, but it's clear that he'd spent some time working as an electrician, which is likely how he knew how to distort his voice. He'd been married at one point, and the couple had a son, but his wife divorced him in 1976, and it's believed she gained full custody of their child. Larry was also briefly enrolled in the Marines, but was discharged after accidentally shooting himself in the leg while cleaning a firearm. As investigators soon found out, Larry perfectly fit the profile created by the FBI, except for his age. While he was a little older than expected at 35, 
Larry was white, somewhat overweight, divorced, and demonstrated above-average intelligence. Moreover, his past was also riddled with crimes against women, including the attempted kidnapping of a college student. Ellis and Sharon Shepard recalled that he seemed incredibly anxious when he picked them up from the airport following their trip and only wanted to talk about Sherry's disappearance. Investigators got a search warrant for the Shepard's home and found several incriminating pieces of evidence that included six blonde hairs. While they were never forensically tested, the hairs appeared microscopically similar to Sherry's, and they didn't belong to the Shepherds or anyone they knew, so it was looking like they'd finally nailed down their initial crime scene. Larry likely thought that investigators would never look at the Shepherd's home and brought Sherry there to cover his tracks. Despite having criminal experience, he didn't account for the police to discover his connection with the Shepherds because of the phone number indentation left on the piece of paper. Given the mounting evidence, Larry Jean Bell was arrested on June 27, 1985, 28 days after Sherry vanished from the end of her driveway. He denied any involvement in the deaths of Sherry or Deborah May, instead placing blame on the bad Larry, his supposed alter ego, and claiming that he'd actually been the one responsible for the crimes. Although Larry's reference to the bad Larry could be his way of trying to play crazy in front of investigators, in other words, his effort to manipulate his way out of blame and be declared legally insane so he cannot be tried, it's also possible that a murderer like Larry could have a split personality of sorts. We don't know Larry's diagnosis, but his actions closely align with those of a severely disturbed psychopath. While some researchers and scientists believe that there is no such thing as a split personality, others believe that it occurs in rare cases, such as in dissociative identity disorder. However, if we look at the way that psychopaths can cut off their own emotions, the way they can manipulate and shift from being charismatic to being violent and aggressive, shows that there is some sort of splitting of their personality. Larry's trial for the kidnapping and murder of Sherry Smith began in February 1986, and he made sure to put on a dramatic show during his six-hour-long testimony. He shouted many bizarre things, seemingly in an attempt to make the jury question his sanity, such as, Mona Lisa is a man, and silence is golden, my friend. Fortunately, no one was buying his antics. After just 47 minutes, the jury found him guilty of kidnapping and first-degree murder. Larry was given the death penalty, but he still had another trial to face. In 1987, the trial for the kidnapping and murder of Deborah May Helmet commenced, and the jury returned the same verdict, guilty on all counts. When given a choice between lethal injection or the electric chair, Larry chose the chair, and he was finally put to death on October 4th, 1996, after having served 10 years on death row. He offered no condolences or last words. Now, our story could end right there, but there's one more thing I'd like to mention. Larry remains a strong suspect in the cases of two other missing women from Charlotte, North Carolina. 26-year-old Sandy Elaine Cornett was in a relationship with one of Larry's co-workers before she vanished in 1984, and 21-year-old Denise Newsom porch disappeared in 1975 from an apartment complex just 300 yards from Larry's home. While he's never been charged with either disappearance, Many investigators firmly believe that Sandy and Denise were also victims of Larry Jean Bell. Either way, he's an evil predator who fully deserved what he got. With these types of cases, many people wonder why someone would be so cruel and commit such horrific acts. Tragically, the behaviors of people like Larry Jean Bell could at least be partially explained by the fact that they derive some sort of enjoyment from the process of kidnapping, murdering, and in Larry's case, terrorizing the family members of the victims. Killers like Larry are often triggered by a major life stressor, such as marital or relationship issues or work or financial difficulties that can cause the person to spiral and then go on a murder spree. Additionally, to make matters worse, these individuals are often rejected by society as they're often not liked and generally don't get along well with others. This causes these individuals to become isolated and their seclusion likely also worsens their mental state. They develop uncontrolled anger at others and at the world, and often have an intense desire for revenge. Our family lawyers, etc. And he took the, little, the middle one and just took off with her in my car. Well, this is my other car, but the other car's registered in my name. Okay. And where, now he's telling me he won't give it back. Where, where would he be going? Just home? Probably or? home, I'm guessing. Right. And now he's trying but to play games with me house. on the phone. No, we've been separated for a few weeks now. I'm staying at my parents'. Okay. 
So what, what's led up to this, just that you've seen each other and he's decided yeah, and you Yeah, and he's decided that because I've said to him you need to wait until we can get this sorted, yeah. you're not having them stay with you because okay. you won't return them. And then I'm like, you go and pull a f stunt like this. The other two are absolutely beside themselves. She's pulling her eyes out. Was anything, like, any other words exchanged? Like, did he, like, how was he acting? Or he's just said Well, that just a psycho just... that he's taking her, and that's it. And then he just called me now and said, you know, you either bring the other two back or I keep her. On the outside, Rowan Baxter seemed like the perfect husband and father. That is, until he committed a crime so heinous that it made international headlines. Still, this isn't the story of a violent tragedy that occurred in just a few short minutes, but rather the slow and quiet unraveling of a psychopath hiding in plain sight. Rowan Baxter first met Hannah Clark in 2009, when she was 19 and he was 30, and despite the age difference, they appeared to be a match made in heaven. She was a trampoline champion who had represented Queensland four years in a row, and he was a professional rugby player from New Zealand. The couple married in 2012 and opened a gym together before welcoming three beautiful children, Aaliyah, Leana, and Trey. Still, something dark was hiding underneath the smiles they shared all over social media. Growing up, Rowan was remembered by family and friends as a hateful child who engaged in rough and violent forms of play. As he got older, he became very disrespectful towards women and would often say that they were only good for two things, housework and intimacy. According to relatives, his pathological hatred of women stemmed from the influence of his father and grandfather, who shared those same misogynistic beliefs. With that in mind, it comes as no surprise that Hannah was subjected to various forms of non-physical abuse at the hands of her husband. Rowan would regularly snoop through her phone and social media accounts, often accusing her of cheating even if the messages he found were from men he knew from work. But that wasn't all. Rowan also controlled what Hannah was allowed to wear, forbidding her from dressing in a way that might attract other men and from wearing the color pink because he deemed it too childish. One of Hannah's friends, a domestic violence support worker, actually told her that she was experiencing financial and emotional abuse in her marriage. But unfortunately, as with many victims of abuse, Hannah didn't feel that was true since Rowan had never laid a hand on her. Many people unknowingly dismiss early warning signs, convincing themselves that they are making a big deal out of nothing simply because there's no physical violence. What many people don't realize is that verbal threats and emotional manipulation are abuse and can be just as emotionally detrimental as physical violence. Many partners who are abusive also have antisocial personality disorder, APD, or at least traits of APD. In December 2019, Hannah finally decided to leave Rowan after he allegedly twisted her arm in the car in front of their children. She took Aaliyah, Liana, and Trey and moved in with her parents, who took extra security precautions to keep Rowan away, including reinforcing the home's exterior and ensuring that the kids knew to always keep the doors locked. But Hannah was still terrified, because at one point, Rowan had threatened that if she ever left him, he would kill one of their kids and then himself. It's important to note that the most dangerous time for victims of domestic abuse is when they first leave their abuser this is generally when the violence will escalate and when the most serious tragedies often occur. Making threats like the ones Rowan made are typical of people who have certain personality disorders, like antisocial and sometimes borderline personality. It's the ultimate form of manipulation, and when an abusive partner starts to make these sorts of threats, the abuse has already escalated and gotten out of control. During this tumultuous time, Rowan shared his feelings on social media, posting about how much he loved his family, but those close felt it was all a ruse to make people angry with Hannah. Nevertheless, he was granted reasonable visitation with his kids, but things took a scary turn later that month. Rowan got word that Hannah and the children would be at a car park in Brisbane, so he confronted her regarding their visitation agreement. He asked if the kids could stay with him, and Hannah replied that it wouldn't happen without a court order. Then, without warning, Rowan grabbed his youngest daughter, Liana, threw her into the backseat of his car, and sped away from the car park. Hannah called the police, but because he was the father, they claimed he had a right to take Liana at any time. Without a protective order against him or a custody agreement in place, a parent can take physical custody of their child without it being considered a crime. Please note that the legal analysis is from an American law perspective, though the case occurred in Australia. Rowan had Liana at his home for four days, 
and following the terrifying ordeal, Hannah served him with a domestic violence order. Going against his lawyer's advice, Rowan refused to sign an authorized permission form submitted by Hannah that allowed him 165 days of custody per year. Then, after the domestic violence order was changed in the Holland Park Magistrate's Court, Rowan was given full access to his children. Furthermore, Rowan eventually signed a parenting contract that granted him the same level of access to the kids without any legal restraints. However, his rights to the children were withdrawn in early February after he was charged with breaking the domestic violence order for allegedly assaulting Hannah. As you'll see, this case exposed many flaws in the legal system. When called in for questioning, Rowan appeared annoyed with the police and could be seen rolling his eyes. Not interview? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Like I was saying to him that everyone's got the right to speak to their solicitor, which he's done. And if you don't want to interview, I won't question him, obviously. Um, and then, yeah, I'll advise him of what we're going to do going forward. When Rowan breached the order, one of Hannah's closest friends actually went to the police and told them that she was concerned he might take them out, meaning Hannah and the kids. The friend also mentioned that Rowan was abnormally rough with his kids. She showed them a video he'd posted of himself trying to force their youngest child, Trey, into an ice bath, despite him screaming hysterically. Still, life went on, and a few days later, Rowan FaceTimed his children as he often did, but something was very different this time. He was sobbing uncontrollably, and Hannah even remarked to a friend that something about the exchange just didn't sit right. What nobody knew at the time was that Rowan was preparing to make them all suffer the very next day. On the morning of February 19, 2020, someone spotted Rowan at a gas station filling up a canister of petroleum. Meanwhile, Hannah was busy getting all three kids loaded into her car to take them to school. Once the children were all strapped into their car seats, Hannah got into the driver's seat, completely unaware of the imminent danger. Before she even had a chance to react, Rowan emerged from the bushes outside her parents' home and jumped into the car's passenger seat. He held a knife at Hannah's neck as he drenched her and all three of their children in petrol, and then he ordered her to drive. Hannah began driving, but when she noticed a man outside washing his car, she headed in his direction and began screaming out the window, "'Call the police! He's thrown petrol over us!' The man could see that Hannah was fighting against Rowan to exit the vehicle, and in the blink of an eye, there was a series of booming explosions, followed by an eruption of flames. Warning, the details that follow are extremely disturbing. Hannah managed to jump out of the car, but she was on fire. Though on fire, Hannah managed to jump out of the car and began rolling in the grass. A man nearby valiantly tried to hose her down, but she suffered burns to 97% of her body. By this point, other residents began flooding out to help, and it was then that people realized there were children stuck in the car. But when they tried to approach the inferno, Rowan brandished a knife and demanded that everyone get away and let her burn. The crazed tormentor attempted to re-enter the car before stabbing himself in the chest. Rowan Baxter died at the scene at the age of 42. Barely clinging to life, Hannah frantically called out to onlookers, pleading with them to save her children and call her mum. The heroic mother even maintained the strength to tell the police exactly what had happened before succumbing to her injuries later that night at the hospital. Hannah Clark was 31 years old. Hannah's mother later commented on her daughter's remarkable strength following the attack, saying, It was truly to make him pay. She didn't know he was dead. She was going to fight for her babies to the end. Tragically, Aaliyah, Leana, and Trey burned to death in their car seats before rescuers could even reach them. They were just six, four, and three years old. Family members and loved ones of people experiencing domestic violence often feel helpless and frustrated as they see the victim involved in the cycle of violence, and it appears Hannah's parents and brother were limited with what they were able to do about the red flags they witnessed and Rowan's alarming behaviors. After the horrific crime, investigators discovered a disturbing phone call Rowan had made to a men's helpline the day before the murders. It seemed as though he just wanted to make sure his court case looked good following the separation. Not my idea, but apparently I have to do it. I'm not the one that has the problem, but I guess um, I'm just doing what I'm told. Okay, uh, we have to do something about it. 
well, I just think it's going to put me in a better position. The fact that Rowan sounded upbeat during the call could have been because he had already decided on a solution to calm his anger and desire for revenge, that he would murder Hannah and the kids. It's possible that this decision served to at least partly quench the burning desire he had to get back at Hannah. If Rowan is a psychopath, it makes sense that he would be so vindictive. People with APD have such poor impulse control and poor emotional regulation. Revenge is the only thing that really satisfies them. If they perceive that someone has harmed them, they will stop at nothing. The payback of a psychopath will be far more severe than any harm the victim did to them. Investigators also found surveillance footage captured two days before the murders from a nearby hardware store. Rowan could be seen browsing the shelves before purchasing a fuel can, zip ties, and cleaning fluid items he would later use to destroy his entire family. While Rowan wasn't alive to face the consequences of his actions or explain them, it's believed that he'd intended to drive the family out to a remote location where he would kill them all and then himself. The fact that Rowan was sobbing uncontrollably the day before the attack could mean that he felt some form of sorrow for what he was planning to do. However, assuming he has APD, his actions the following day show how well a psychopath can cut off their emotions. At the end of the day, Rowan was more concerned about himself and his own desires. People with APD will always put themselves first, and if left with what they believe is no other option, they will sacrifice their loved ones. The murder of Hannah Clark and her children exposed serious flaws in how Australia handles domestic violence. Fortunately, with the help of her parents, the tragedy prompted the criminalization of coercive control, the form of abuse Rowan used to manipulate Hannah, how to spot a potentially abusive partner. Abusive partners may not start being abusive until after some time has passed and until the relationship develops. They can be very charming and protective. Their protectiveness is a quality that the victim may initially even like. However, beneath that protectiveness, is really possessiveness that begins to manifest and worsen with time. In reality, what they want is total control over their partner. Abusive partners will criticize the victim to no end. Constant criticism and negative comments are part of the whole manipulation package constructed by the perpetrator to control the victim. At their core, perpetrators are highly insecure and have a very poor concept of themselves. This is why grandiosity and narcissism has such a central role in their personality. We've talked about this subject in many of our videos, and we've provided the red flags as a tool for anyone to use in the event that you may be suspicious that you're in such a relationship. If you feel that you are, please find someone to talk to, get help, and do what you need to do for you and anyone that may be involved with you. An abuser will try to trap you and tell you you're not worth anything, that you won't survive without them, or that your children will never want to stay with you. You are worth so much more. When a terrified young girl bursts into a Hong Kong police station and exclaims that the ghost of a woman is tormenting her, officers are skeptical to say the very least. They initially believed she was delusional, but when the girl started divulging details about how the woman was killed, they knew there was much more to the twisted story. But then, Everything took a sinister turn when she admitted to taking part in the woman's death, and what they found when they followed her to a flat in a rundown district was more horrific than anyone could have ever imagined. But let's start at the beginning. It was May 1999 when the distressed 14-year-old girl known as Ah Fong walked into the police station and said that she was being haunted by the spirit of a blood-soaked young woman. Ah Fong claimed the ghost would continue to torment her until she confessed to her role in the crime but she wasn't the only one responsible. Ah Fong explained that she'd actually been the youngest and only female participant in a group consisting of rich and powerful men. The people she said were responsible for the woman's death were part of the Chinese mafia, and one of them, Chan Man Lok, was her boyfriend. He was 34, and as I already mentioned, she was just 14. In any case, after telling her bizarre story, Ah Fong led officers to her boyfriend's flat in Hong Kong's Kowloon district, and what they discovered was enough to shock the entire nation. Hidden inside a large Hello Kitty mermaid doll, authorities found the decapitated skull of a woman. The victim was later identified as a 23-year-old nightclub hostess and prostitute named Fan Man Yi. Detectives quickly learned of the young woman's troubled past filled with abandonment and suffering. 
At just 16 years old, Fan had been kicked out of the orphanage where she spent most of her youth and was forced to fend for herself. She often resorted to petty crimes for survival and eventually started working in a brothel to feed her growing drug addiction. Please note that the following details all came from Afong's testimony and that due to a lack of solid forensic evidence, certain aspects of her story have not been officially verified as factually accurate. Many of Fan's customers were involved in organized crime, including one of her regulars, Chan Man Lok, a wealthy socialite and triad gang member. While it's widely reported that Chan was the drug lord of Hong Kong, he's never been charged with any drug-related offenses. It's speculated that this was due to his power and influence. Fan and Chan first met in 1997, and Chan, along with his crew of henchmen, would frequently pay her for extended time with her, involving the use of drugs. But one night, she made a fatal mistake. In March 1999, after wrapping up one of her many binge sessions with Chan, Fan decided to steal his wallet, which had around 4,000 Hong Kong dollars inside, translating to roughly 500 US dollars. It didn't take long for Chan to realize what had happened, and when he did, he flew into a blind rage. Beyond demanding that Fan repay him the $4,000 she'd stolen, he also tacked on an extra $10,000 in interest. Fan immediately returned the $4,000 but said she would need a little time to collect the remaining sum. Chan was unsatisfied by this response and feared she would run away, so he ordered two other gang members, 27-year-old Leung Xing Cho and 21-year-old Leung Wai Lin, to kidnap Fan off the street and deliver her to his flat. Once there, Fan was routinely offered to paying customers, with Chan collecting all of her earnings, but things in that apartment quickly got out of control. Now, please note that the following details are incredibly graphic, and as a reminder, most could not be officially verified beyond Afong's statement. Fan was held hostage for an entire month and subjected to unimaginable torture at the hands of Chan, his two henchmen, and his young girlfriend, Afong. They would use fire and various blunt objects to inflict maximum pain on the young woman every single day. But eventually, clients refused to pay for time with Fan because they no longer found her mangled body attractive. Realizing his repayment plan had fallen apart, Chan's anger towards Fan escalated, and the beatings became more severe. They would sometimes even wrap electrical wires around Fan's hands and suspend her from a hook in the ceiling for hours on end. While Ah Fong allegedly didn't assault Fan as much as the men, she was still a willing participant and when they weren't torturing her, the group would play video games and do drugs in the other room. Then, sometime around mid-April 1991, Fan's body finally succumbed to the abuse, and she died while locked in the bathroom alone. When Chan and his accomplices realized she was dead, they moved her body to the bathtub and began dismembering it with a handsaw. Then, as if that wasn't horrific enough, they boiled some parts of her body in an attempt to avoid the odors emitted by decomposition and threw them away in the trash. Some sources state that they actually used the same pots to cook their dinner later that day and stored a few of her organs in the fridge. As their final evil act against Fan, the men stuffed her skull into the oversized Hello Kitty plush and sewed it back up, giving this horrific crime the nickname the Hello Kitty Murder. During their search of the flat, investigators uncovered her skull, several teeth on the floor, and the remaining organs. When questioned, the three men claimed that they had been running a consensual brothel with Fan when she died from an accidental overdose. They said the choice to hide her body stemmed from fear of getting in trouble with the police. Unfortunately, because medical examiners could not determine a cause of death, there was virtually no proof that the men had intentionally killed Fan. As a result, they were all charged with manslaughter instead of murder. Nevertheless, Chan Man Lo, Leung Xing Cho, and Leung Wai Lun were all sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving 20 years. As an interesting note, psychiatric evaluations later found no mental illnesses among the trio, although the judge did describe the men as having psychopathic tendencies. When psychopaths commit acts of repeated torture over such a long period of time, like the way they did with Fan, it's a sign of severe psychopathy. Though Chan has not been formally diagnosed, his behavioral presentation aligns with APD. If people with APD are slighted in any way, even in a minor sense, they will seek revenge and they will go after the person full force. Their egos are so inflated that they can't stand, they can't allow, 
another person to get one over on them, as Chan may have believed Fan did when she stole from him. They cannot tolerate even the slightest act of what they perceive to be disrespect, because of their grandiose view of themselves, and because they are unable to control their anger and impulses, they will go to extreme lengths to get back at someone. Despite her admitted participation in the crime and therefore legal culpability, Ah Fong wasn't charged for her participation in exchange for the information she provided to authorities. In 2012, the flat where this unthinkable crime took place was demolished, symbolically giving Fan Man Yi the freedom she deserves.